I got to tell you, it's really a blessing for me to be back with you. My name is Greg Marksberry, and while John is on his uh, study break this month, he invited me to come uh, today and share with you what a blessing it is, and uh, we are so thrilled to be here. We're planting a church in Lake Nona, and you're partnered with us in that effort, and we're so grateful for you. Got my wife, Eliana, and daughter, Lael, with me today, and thrilled that they could join us and get the chance to worship with the Journey family. This is such a great church, and you know, there is a lot that has happened in our city since I was with you last on Mother's Day. There's a lot that's happened in our world, right? And I am so grateful, so, so thankful that our city has a church like Journey to hold up the grace and love of Jesus in times like these. We thank God for you because Jesus is the answer, right? He is the answer for our city's need, our nation's need, our world's need, for every one of our needs. And so we want to come to him today in worship. And before we open his word, I'm going to ask, would you just bow with me and let's go to him in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, there is no greater liberty than the freedom from sin and death that we find in Jesus. We worship him and him alone today. Lord, would you help us to lift up Jesus as the hope of our city, the hope of our nation, the hope of our families, the hope of our world. This weekend, we give thanks to you, Lord, for our freedom and for each and every person who has sacrificed for freedom's sake. May we always cherish the hard-won freedom we have in America and never take it for granted, knowing that it has come at the cost of so many lives over these past two centuries. We call on you today, Lord, as the God of our fathers, as the author of liberty, and we pray, long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might our great God and King. Now, Father, through your Spirit, would you speak to our hearts today and give every single person here just the message that you have tailored for us. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you know, it's incredible to witness baptism. And I think baptism is this incredible response that God's given us to our faith, right? I mean, what an an amazing response to our faith, this thing called baptism. And the, the question I want to unpack with you today is what follows baptism? Like, what is life supposed to look like after we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior? You know, baptism is this response to faith when we decide, look, Jesus died for me. And he paid the price for my sin. And so I want to make him my Lord and Savior. I want to give my life to him and follow him the rest of my days. So we died with him in the waters of baptism. And then we're raised up with him into this newness of life. But what does life look like then? I'm assuming a lot of us here have already made that decision to be baptized, right, into Christ. And Let's just look together a little bit of what the journey looks like after that decision. I mean, is it just behavior modification, or is there something deeper? Is there something more to it? Now, uh, Jesus reclaims us. When we come to him, we make him our Lord and Savior, he reclaims us. He makes us his own. And I was thinking about reclaiming uh, this week and thought, you know, reclaiming is something that's a pretty big deal today. People reclaim all kinds of stuff today. I mean, like I was at a coffee shop a couple weeks ago, and I was having a cup of coffee, and I looked at the sleeve around the cup of coffee, and it said, reclaimed from recycled waste. (laughs) I kind of wish I hadn't seen that, actually, (laughs) as I was having that cup of coffee. And people love to reclaim stuff. Like reclaiming furniture is a really big deal today. Do any of you have any reclaimed furniture in your house? few of you do that's a big deal you see it all over the place in fact I brought with me this little this little stool so after my grandfather who's like my hero passed away a few years ago uh, he's a Kentucky farmer World War II a vet and uh, my hero you know and so I went into his barn that he hadn't been in there for a while and um, I found this milk stool laying there and I remembered as a kid him sitting on this milk stool 
milking his cows, you know. And it was rusted out, and it was just lying there in this old barn, and I, I took it out. I took it out of the old barn and kind of sanded off the rust and repainted it and took it home to my wife, and she said, yeah, that'll work great as a plant stand. And so she repurposed this milk stool as a plant stand in our home. But every time I see it, I think of my granddad and the influence he had on my life and how grateful I am for him. So we've repurposed that old milk stool now to, in our home. And it, it, it's a reminder as well to me of how God reclaims us in life. Now, when it comes to reclaiming things, uh, one of the things that I always think about are those old tires. Like, have you ever seen a tire that's been maybe painted white and put out in someone's front yard and uh, used as a flower bed. You ever seen that? Like, I'll tell you, I come from Kentucky, right? Like your Pastor John. And uh, he could tell you, too, like, we can reclaim just about anything in the state of Kentucky, right? And I think that practice of reclaiming those old tires began in Kentucky. That had to be where it started. But when it comes to reclaiming stuff, uh, this really takes the cake when I saw this. Like, just check out this picture. Like, why would you throw away... <laughs> Why would you ever throw away a perfectly good toilet, man, if it could be used for that, right? And, and here's a real piece of art. Check this out. So someone reclaimed this. I mean, what a nice shelf to have in your bathroom, right? But, man, nothing compares to this piece of reclamation. Check it out. So that could be your go-kart right there. It, complete with the toilet seat steering wheel and the cooler is in the back. And, and I guess they put the toilet paper on there for the streamer effect, man, as you're showing off cruising through the neighborhood. But well, what is the point of reclaiming these things anyway? I mean, why would we reclaim old toilets or why would we reclaim old tires? Why would we reclaim a milk stool or, or an old piece of furniture? What's the idea behind reclaiming? Well, we reclaim it in order to repurpose it. Right? We give it a new purpose. So, so reclaim means to repurpose. And when we make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, we come to him to receive his saving grace and the promise of eternal life. He reclaims us as his own, his child. And then he repurposes our lives. And, and it's not really with a new purpose. He repurposes us with his original purpose the purpose with which he created us in the beginning. When he formed the first man and woman, you know, there in the Garden of Eden, when he created man from the dust of the ground and made us in his image and breathed into us the breath of life, he created us to be a sanctuary, you know, like a temple in which he would dwell, in which his presence would abide so that we could give him praise. He made us to know him and to be known by him, to walk through this life, every step of the journey, every day of our lives, to go through this life in real relationship with him, our creator God. Isn't it amazing? The God who created the universe wants to be in relationship with him. I love the way John Piper writes about this. And he says it this way. He says, you were made not to be somebody, but to know somebody. See, God made you to know him, to be loved by him, to be in relationship with him. So that means no one here is here by accident. There's not a person on the planet who's an accident. God created you. He made you for a reason. That's to know him and be known by him, to, to be loved by him, and to love him in return. So that's, that's the purpose that he, he speaks into our heart and to our souls as we come to give him our lives. He, he repurposes us to live life. Now, the, the problem is we tend to lose our purpose in this life. You know, we, we tend to get refocused on other things, right? I mean, we get caught up in all the things going on around us in this world, and, and we miss our mission. You know, we kind of miss the reason we were made. And we start chasing after all the things that this world says is important, that this world says will bring satisfaction. And we end up heading down all these different paths that ultimately lead to destruction. We start chasing after the temporary things rather than the eternal things. We start giving our lives to things that are fleeting 
and meaningless and momentary and miss out on the things that are eternal. You know, relationships, people, God's word, his church, his mission, relationship with Jesus. And we trade all that for the temporary stuff that at the end of the day never really satisfies, never really fulfills us in this life. It's one of the most powerful images that we have in the Bible of this idea of how we so easily miss our purpose in life comes from Hosea chapter 7, verse 16. The prophet Hosea is talking of the nation of Israel and this entire nation of people. And he says that, that they turn away from the Most High God and have become like faulty bows. Faulty bows, right? Faulty bow and arrow. And so what's a faulty bow do? It misses the target, right? So that's what was happening with the people of Israel, this entire nation of God. They, they kind of forgot what it was about. Rather than following after God and seeking him, they start going their own way, doing their own thing, rather than not just receiving God's love, but sharing that love with the whole world, which was their mission. They, they kind of keep it in, forget about it, do their own thing. And they miss the fact that God made them for a relationship with him and to share that love with the people around them. And they become like a broken bow. I think that's a sad image, a broken bow. When I think of a broken bow, I think about, you know, maybe the Native American Indian mounds, you know, and how we might find broken bows. And it just kind of brings this sad image to my mind. It's the image of a missed purpose, you know. And so often... We can be like broken bows because we get distracted and sidetracked with the things of this world rather than the things of God, and we miss the purpose for which we were created. So when we come to Jesus and we make him our Lord, we're baptized, then what he does after that is he refashions, remolds, remakes, renews, restores, repurposes our lives to follow him. When I think of how God is able, he can do this with any life, he can repurpose any man or woman. When I think about his power to repurpose, one of the things that always comes to my mind is uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, I was, uh, planning, we had planted a church in Atlanta, and our church decided to help another new church get started, a church in, the, in a place in Atlanta called Buckhead. Cool place in the city of Atlanta. And uh, this church, uh, we, we called a, a, a planter. His name was Dan Garrett. And, and Dan was all excited about planting this church. We came behind him along with other churches to help that church get off the ground. And, and Dan was just praying through the city one day. And he came to this building that was all boarded up. And he kind of paused there. And God began to press into his spirit that this was the place that, that God wanted him to start the church. Now, the, the unique thing about this building is this building had quite a reputation and had a reputation for years prior in the city of Atlanta. So it was a place called the Gold Club. It was a place that for years and years, like professional athletes and, and movie stars and rock stars, that when they would come to town, if, if they were into this kind of thing, they, they would go to the Gold Club. It had quite the reputation. So much of a reputation, the FBI took an interest and discovered the mob was literally running the Gold Club. And so they shut it down, boarded it up. And Dan's praying. And this is the place God's telling him to start a church. So a number of us, my wife included, we went there and we began to clean this place up. I got to tell you, it was such a really kind of a nasty environment. Been sitting there for like a year and a half or two years. We began to clean this place up. And I'll never forget going into the locker room. I didn't even know that uh, places like that had locker rooms. But went into a locker room and as we were cleaning out the lockers, I opened one locker, and there was a locker door, and it was just covered with pictures of beautiful young women with their babies and their small children. I got to tell you, it broke my heart, man. Like, it was such a moment. As, as more of as Ellie, my wife, and others saw those pictures, we came together, and we began to pray for those women and pray for those children. And we thought not just about a place that had been broken down, but lives that were broken, that needed hope, that needed love and peace, the power of Jesus in their, their hearts. And we began to pray for those people. And, and God just totally gave us this amazing picture of how he is able to restore through his love and grace any person 
as we prayed for them. And, and, and it really brought this thought, you know, that took away this mystique, this image of dancers. And now these were daughters and mothers who needed the love of Jesus just like we need it. For that, that, that place, the, the news picked up on it. It was awesome. And it became, this became a wonderful picture in our city of Atlanta at that time for how God is able to repurpose anything and anyone through his power and, his, and for his glory. It is an amazing thought. And that's true. This is what God does. I'll tell you another great example of this is a guy named the Apostle Paul. Before he became the Apostle Paul, his name was Saul. And he was on a mission to kill Christians, literally kill Christians. And he was traveling all over the place to get it done. He went to a place in Syria called Damascus, chasing down Christians, hunting them down to throw them in jail. And so God met him on the road to Damascus, totally changed his life. You talk about repurposing. He took Saul, this Jewish Pharisee, on a mission to kill Christians and imprison them, and he totally remade him. He said, you know what I'm going to do with you, Saul? I'm going to change your name to Paul, and I'm going to send you all over the world not to jail people, but to give them the freedom of Jesus, not to kill people, but to bring them the life of my son, Jesus Christ. You talk about repurposing a, a man that nobody thought could ever be repurposed, a murderer of believers. Jesus Christ totally restored Paul's heart and repurposed his life. He can do it for any of us. That's his power. When we come to follow him, wherever, when we come to make Jesus our Lord, after we've been baptized, it doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done or who we are, where we come from, he can remake us to do things we never thought we could do through his power at work within us, to touch people in ways that will change their eternity. And that's what he's repurposed us for, to know him and to help others get to know him. There's this great picture of how he does this in Matthew chapter 4. Look at what it says in Matthew 4. This is in the gospel, right? Jesus has just begun his ministry, and he's walking around the Sea of Galilee. Look what happens in verse 18. One day Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called to them, come, what? Follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. So Jesus sees Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They're doing what they do, man. They fish. And he takes these two gruff fishermen. He says, you follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Do you get what Jesus did there? He just totally repurposed their lives. He said, that might be the job you do, but I've got a higher calling in this, something that's bigger than even your job, and that is to help me reach people to know that God loves them. And, and he repurposes Peter's life. He repurposes Andrew's life as he did all of the apostles, as, as he does all of us. And he, and he restored them, first of all, to a relationship with God that was real, and then to his mission, which was to share that love with others. Now, you know, that's what happens. When, when, we, when we come to know Jesus, we're baptized into him, we receive his grace, we start getting to know him more and more and more. And the more we get to know Jesus, you know, the more we love what he loves the more we want to do what he does. And that's what life starts looking like on the other side of baptism. We become more and more like Jesus in life. Now, when we apply that to our lives, it, it really shifts. When our hearts begin to beat with the heart of God, as we get to know God and receive his love more and more and love him more and more, it kind of shifts our focus. I mean, you might be a banker, you might be a doctor or a teacher, might be a truck driver, I don't know. Uh, whatever we do, that's awesome. Praise God for those gifts and skills that allow us to do those things to help people. But we're not just a doctor or a lawyer or a banker or a trucker or a teacher. We've got a higher calling than that. God's given us those platforms so we can reach out to people and love them and point them to Jesus. You might be a stay-at-home mom. You're not just a stay-at-home mom. Your purpose is to develop children to become little ambassadors for Jesus Christ. See, when we follow Jesus, when we get to love God and start loving him more and more, our lives start to reflect what he loves. And he loves people. And he loves lost people. He loves people that are far from him. 
And so when we get to know him, he puts this burden on our heart to love them, to reach out to them, to use whatever platform we have to help them know there's a God who created them and who knows them, and he wants them to know him, who loves them and longs for them to love him back. And God refashions us and repurposes us for this mission. So this life after baptism, I mean, what the life of the believer looks like, I think Jesus sums it up pretty profoundly in just two words. All through the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read of Jesus using these two words all over the place. We just read the two words that he said to Peter and Andrew, and he says them so many times. The two words are, follow me. See, that's what the life of a believer looks like. It's following Jesus. It's follow me. That's what Jesus said. And that's what we spend our lives doing. We just follow Jesus. Look at what he says here in Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and what? Follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. See, the, the, we get caught in this trap where we want to hang on to all this stuff that we think is ours. We don't hang on to this life. Man, you get one time to go around. This is my life. I want to hang on to it. I want to go my way, do my thing. And Jesus is saying, man, that's all backwards. You're missing the mark. You're missing the purpose of what God made you for. When you're able to grab hold of God and his love for you, you're able to give all that stuff of the world up, and you're able to follow him, and then you find what real life is all about. Let me tell you, friend, the emptiest lives on this planet are the lives that are full of themselves. And you know what the fullest lives on this planet are? The fullest lives of anybody you'll ever meet are the lives of those who are willing to empty themselves for others, for the glory of God. So this is who we're following. It's exactly what he did for us. Jesus emptied himself out of love for us to save us. And, and God filled him up with the highest name, the name that's above every name. And he calls us to follow him. So let me just kind of take this, these two words, follow me, and boil them down to two simple action steps for you. Jesus gives us these. And he gives us these, these in his last uh, commission, his last great command. It's called the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Some of you know it. It says, he says this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Some of you have just been baptized. But what happens then? What happens after baptism? Then he says, and teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you, that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Wow. So what's it look like to follow Jesus? Well, one thing it looks like is... We follow whatever he says. We follow whatever he says. To follow Jesus means we follow whatever he says. Whatever he teaches, we follow it. So when we become a believer, part of the Christian life is to get to know what he says. We dive into the word of God. We get around teaching, around preaching. We get around brothers and sisters in Christ. And we learn and we grow through what we learn. But it's not just getting a head full of knowledge, is it? That knowledge has to mature kind of matriculate down to our heart and to our hands and our feet into action. See, the, 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 the word Christian is a noun, right? But we learned in elementary school every noun needs a verb, and every Christian needs a verb too, right? It's a, it's a lifestyle of action, of doing. So let me, let me put it to you this way. Did you realize that there are over 600,000 bypass surgeries, heart bypass surgeries in America every year? 600,000. You know what? The doctors tell those bypass surgery patients the same thing every time. They say, after bypass, if you want to live a healthier life, there, there, there are certain things you need to do. You need to cut back on the alcohol. You need to stop smoking. You need to eat a better diet. And you need to exercise on a regular basis. Tell every patient those, those same things. The problem is that 90% of the people, they know what they're supposed to do, but 90%, although they know it, don't do it. See, information does not equal transformation. So when we follow Jesus, the, the idea is that he teaches us here it is to do, to follow him in whatever he's teaching us. We obey what he says. So the more we know, the more we're able to live out 
Because that's the best way. That's the way that's going to bring the most fulfillment and joy and peace and impact to our lives. So we follow him. That's what he made us to do. See, Jesus, the lifestyle he teaches us doesn't just help get more people into heaven. You know what it does? It brings more heaven into earth. Because as we live out his way, we bring his love and his power and his truth into this world, into our environment, into our homes, into our workplaces, into our communities and our churches. Where we're able to bring more of heaven, more of his way into our experience and the experience of those around us. And it makes an impact that ultimately helps more people get to heaven. So we follow him. This is, this is what it looks like, folks. After baptism, we, we follow what he teaches. There's one more thing he says here in the Great Commission. He says, and surely I'm with you always to the very ends of the age or to the ends of the earth. So not only do we follow what he teaches, but we follow, we follow wherever he leads. Wherever he leads, we follow. Now, this can be a tough one. You know, he may not lead you to the most remote places on earth to share the gospel like he did the Apostle Paul. He may just be leading you across the street to love on a neighbor and to help someone who's hurting in the name of Jesus. He might be leading you across the hallway at the office. He might be leading you across the room in your own home just to demonstrate the heart of God, the love of Jesus for those around you. But wherever he leads us, we follow. Can I get really real with you for a minute? So we're planting this new church in Lake Nona. So thrilled to get to do that. And I, we're planting this church having served a great church, large mega church up in northern Kentucky. I was the senior pastor there. and We loved it. It was kind of my home area where I grew up. And um, kind of envisioned this would be where I would retire, right? And so then God puts this burden on my heart to plant a new church. And not just a church, but a church that's focused on the next generation. When I say that, I mean kids. Because do you realize, they call this the 4 to 14 window. Do you realize that over 70% of people who ever follow Jesus will do so between the ages of 4 and 14? That's true in any culture. Let me just do a test. If you follow Jesus, if you chose to do that between the ages of 4 and 14, would you just raise your hand real big, real high? Look around. Yeah, that's about right. The majority of us in this room chose to follow him between the ages of 4 and 14. So if we're serious about transforming this world, if we're serious about helping people know God loves them and, and getting more people into heaven, then we've got to reach kids. We've got to reach kids. So God put this burden on my heart to plant a church that's all about that, that, that takes every generation and gives us a mission to, to reach children. Now, I've got to tell you, I've always been about great children's ministries. I love, by the way, the children's ministry at Journey, the new children's ministry center. It, that is exciting. Way to go. So it, it's an exciting ministry that you guys have going, and I love what you're doing in that regard. And I'm going to tell you, man, like in my, in my past, you know, 30 years of doing this, preaching, I've always been a believer in children's ministry. My wife is a great children's ministry person, and we've always had great children's ministries, and we've built some great children's ministries. But it, deep in my heart, if I were honest, I'd have to tell you, a lot of times I was doing that, I was motivated for great children's ministry so I could get the parents of those kids. I want to reach the parents of those kids. And God's totally wrecked my heart. And I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to you know, just kind of say to you today, like, I think I was missing it with that approach. And where God's taken me today is this. He's called me to, to plant a church that reaches kids, not just to reach the parents, but to reach the kids. To reach the kids. Because the kids aren't the future of the church. They are the church. And, and they're the hope of the church in the generations to come. And we must reach children. And so God, and, and so I, I gotta tell you, like we, we did our first vacation Bible school out in the neighborhood park this past week. So every morning at seven, I'm out setting up these canopies and setting up tables with our team and, and we're sweating. Like somebody told me in Florida, like as long as you get it done before 11 in the summer, you're okay. Man, that's a, I don't know where they got that. Like, man, we were sweating to death by 8 a.m. Like I thought, Call, you know, call the paramedics. We're going to die. It was hot. And, and, but it, we were doing this, and I'm thinking, man, how did I go from megachurch preacher to VBS director, you know, for kids in a park? 
And then these little kids started to pour out. One of them was a little fella named Damien. At the end of the week, we had the, the people over to our house, the guests, you know, the kids that were coming. And his grandmother was telling me that Damien doesn't get to see his dad. Harley never hardly gets to see his dad. His dad's in the military, and he sees his dad very, very infrequently. She talked about how her hopes and dreams for Damien to grow up without that influence of his dad, you know, there on a, on a regular basis and to be a strong young man. And just that one example, I'll tell you, it got me. Man, if I had the chance to be a, a, a male role model, a, a manly influence in little Damien's life, thank you, God, for that opportunity to serve that young man, these kids, this past week. Because that's what he's called us to do, to reach kids, the 4 to 14 window. See, wherever God leads you, it may not look, it may not look like you thought it would look. But wherever Jesus leads, friends, if you follow him, he will lead you right to the place where it's more fulfilling than you ever dreamed it could be. It may not be easier, but it will be more fulfilling and more impactful for the people around you than you ever thought it could be. I never thought I would follow Jesus from a mega church to a church that doesn't even exist. But that's where he led me. And I got to tell you, we are living in such a joy and a peace trusting God for every provision and every next step. And I can just testify to you today, when you follow Jesus wherever he leads, you're going to be right where God wants you. And he will use you to make a difference in somebody's life that's going to stretch through eternity. And he'll fill you up in ways this world can't even touch. So the life of following Jesus looks like this. We follow him whatever he says. We follow him wherever he leads. Because we, we, go, we, we grow to love him more and more. Because you know why? We, we realize he loves us more and more the more we follow him. So like in second grade, I had an experience that, that was one of the most humiliating experiences of my life. I, I, it was show and tell. And uh, we had a teacher in second grade named Miss Abernathy, man. That's the stereotypical teacher name. And th she was the stereotypical teacher. Uh, like, she was 108 years old. She had a, a, a tight gray bun in her, you know, her hair. And, and she had a paddle that was about three feet long with holes in it. Like, that's what they did back in my day, right? And so I, I brought this picture of Jesus my grandmother had given me. It was the coolest picture of Jesus. It was just his face, and it was this red hologram. And if you turned the picture, like Jesus' face would change. Like it would follow you. I thought it was the coolest thing as a seven-year-old. You know, So I, I brought this picture to show and tell, and I'm excited to show all of my friends. And I'm like, yeah, look at this picture. It's called a hologram. And it, the, look at Jesus. His face will change and follow you wherever you go. And I'm telling about this. When I get done with my show and tell, Miss Abernathy says, your grandmother got that out of my trash. My grandmother cleaned house for Miss Abernathy one day a week. I was so embarrassed. I think a part of it for me at that time was I was seven. My mom and dad had divorced just a couple of years prior to that. Kind of like Damien, I wasn't seeing my dad very much either in that stretch. And I was wrestling with my own identity and sense of security, you know. And so it was, it was this humiliating moment that kind of sent me on this path for a little while that was like, I started wondering, do I value? I, really, maybe, maybe I'm a guy that belongs in the trash. And I, I don't care who you are or where you come from, all of us as human beings at times struggle with a sense of security and an inner sense of value. Do we matter? And I, wa I want to tell you today, that when you begin a life of following Jesus, when you get to know God more and more, you understand how much he loves you and how much you truly matter, that he is able to repurpose you. He can take you up out of the deepest pit, the darkest hole, any garbage dump on earth, and he can refashion and remake and remold your life with a purpose that is godly and heavenly and beautiful and eternal. It's what he does, and you know why he does it? Because he loves you. 
Do you know the Bible says that God has written your name on the palm of his hand? He's almighty God. Those are big hands. He's got, his, he's got your name tattooed on his hand. He knows you. Another prophet gives this beautiful image that God sings over you. I don't know if it's a lullaby or a love song or what it is, but your father God sings over you. Another prophet says, would an eagle forget the, the eaglets in her nest? Would a mother forget the baby at her breast? Though she may forget, God says, I will not forget you. He knows you. He made you. He loves you. And he longs to reclaim you and restore you to who he made you to be and repurpose your life and send you on a mission to know him more and more, to worship him more and more, to be loved by him more and more so that you can love others more and more for his glory and for their good. Because that's who our God is. He repurposes us. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've come from, whatever you're struggling with, whatever your secrets are, friend, I'm telling you today, he can remake and remold and restore and repurpose your life. Will you let him reclaim you today? That's where it all starts. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the way you're able to reclaim us and restore us and renew us and remake us and remold us and repurpose our lives, God. We've, gone, we've missed the target so often, Lord, and we've ended up in places that uh, have, we've made a mess of it at times, Lord, but you're able to come in and you're able to wipe all of that away through your power and you're able to restore our hearts just like you did for Peter and for Paul. You can do it for us, Lord Jesus. I pray today for every man and woman in this place that you would remold and remake us today, that you would let us come to you and allow you to reclaim us as the children of God, the sons and daughters, the princes and princesses that you created us to be, and that you will repurpose us with the mission of Jesus and the heart of God in this world today so that we might walk in your relationship with your love and share that with everybody we meet. It's through the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.